Okay, so we've only got 15 minutes for this session, which was nominally half an hour. So, you know, I'm going to go fast and stuff. Um, the point of this session is supposed to be a kind of intermediate level, uh, quick overview of some of the core uh, kind of economic principles and arguments that you'll use in lots and lots of debates. Uh, in practice, what it's going to be is an answer to the question in basic terms, what is the role of government in the economy? If we get time, we'll do it in a microeconomic and a macroeconomic sense, but you mostly get the, uh, that, that sort of question in a microeconomic sense, and so that's where uh, we are going to focus to begin with. So, uh, in essence, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the basic case for the role of government in individual sectors of the economy and the basic case again. So, to say some fairly obvious things to begin with, uh, and it's nice to use fancy terms. In technical terms, the debate is between uh, those who are laissez faire versus those who are dirigus. And I don't know why the French dominate this stuff, but anyway, <laughs> they just kind of do. So, this is all about. <laughs> trying to get you comfortable with the kinds of language that you're going to throw around in debates. So I um, don't think it's me being a wanker. Um, I can certainly be a wanker, just for fun. But I'm actually doing it because I think it will be helpful for you to get used to hearing some of these terms if uh, you don't study economics generally or do much reading on it. Difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Um, microeconomics is involved with individual seg segments of the economy. Um, so you know the manufacturing sector or the services sector or the finance sector, these things are uh, uh, where you find microeconomic policy. So when people talk about microeconomic reform, what they're talking about are um, government rules and regulations and taxes and those kind of things which regulate how particular industries operate. So if the government decides to uh, you know, lower the minimum wage, that's a microeconomic reform involved in those segments of the economy that use um, you know, workers at the low end of the pay scale, so things like the services sector. If the government decides to reduce the company tax, that's a microeconomic reform across uh, sectors for businesses that pay company tax in Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Macroeconomics is about the whole economy-wide structures, so things like interest rates and monetary policy, um, you know, what the Reserve Bank is doing, uh, how the government, uh, how government fiscal policy is involved and affects the entire economy. We'll talk about that a bit more later on this afternoon when we look at the US and European economic crises and what governments might do about them, but um, just to get the terms straight. So, when it comes to the question about uh, microeconomics and what is the role of government, generally this is about things like privatisation and whether or not it's appropriate for governments to be involved and to what extent should they be involved. So, let's just set out uh, a couple of the, um, the models of ownership, I guess we can call it. And I'm trying to be as non-specific as I can so that this applies to uh, the widest possible range of industries you might get a particular topic about or you might want to set uh, a case on. So it's full private, uh, it's franchised, it's corporatized, and then surprisingly the other end is full public. And what makes these debates complicated is that certainly in uh, advanced economies like Australia and the US and Europe and those kind of things, uh, there's a wide mixture of all of these within the economy. Uh, there aren't really any, there certainly aren't any countries that are fully down this end that have absolutely privatised everything they possibly could privatise. And there certainly isn't anything you would refer to as a capitalist economy that has full public ownership of every possible sector and industry. So everything is a mixture of them and uh, there are no neat principles or lines that you can draw which describe why uh, you know, Australia has ownership of these things whereas Canada doesn't. Uh, all these things are kind of as much political as they are economic. But anyway, uh, so to give you a quick example of where all of these things occur in the Australian context, think of um, toll roads as a kind of privatised um, public service that's fully privately owned, that's not under a franchise model. Uh, it's under a licensing model, but they're very long, non-competitive models, so you can effectively think of them as being um, fully franchised, uh, fully privately owned. Um, for the franchise model, public transport's the nicest example, I think, for um, certainly most Australian states. So there are much shorter term uh, arrangements than, say, you know, CityLink, which has a 30-year contract. It's very hard to think of that as a franchise. Um, basically, they don't think of it as a franchise. I think 
the license. Uh, whereas if you're, you know, Connex or Yarra Trams or whoever those guys are, you know, you know that uh, I think it's every seven to ten years or something that contract comes up and we've just seen that the train contract was turned over to a different provider. So there is that sort of indirect level of competition and so the franchising model um, has that has that element to it which the private model doesn't have. Also the other thing about franchise models is it usually means that some of the assets remain publicly owned. So in the case of public transport, uh, all the rail track and that, that kind of physical infrastructure is owned by the state and what the private franchisee does is it runs the system rather than owns the system. Um, whereas CityLink of course uh, own the road that they built until the end of the contract in which case it reverts to public ownership. Uh, a corporatized model is where a government uh, agency remains owned by the government, but it's run uh, as much as a business as is humanly possible. So it's run at arm's length from government by a board of management who see themselves as being uh, in a similar state to a, you know, a, a board of governance for a, a corporation. Uh, and you bring in kind of corporate style managers. So instead of stacking it out with uh, senior public servants to run, you stack it out with people who uh, you know, have an industry background. And so, um, yeah, we see it's a pretty good example of that. Uh, you know, people might disagree to an extent about this stuff, but uh, it is run by people who are experts in the media rather than people who are career or public servants. And so that's a kind of corporatized model. Although generally, the corporatized model is about trying to maximise the amount of revenue that government derives from those agencies. Obviously, the government doesn't derive uh, revenue from the ABC, um, and any, any revenue it does make from uh, you know selling the license to ABC um, products or merchandise or programs just goes back into the ABC rather than into general revenue. But for the purposes of our conversation today, it's not a bad example. Uh, and then fully public, again, there's lots of these uh, in Australia still. Public hospitals, public schools, uh, water, uh, water assets in pretty much the entire country are still fully publicly owned. Some of them are operating in a quasi corporate sense. Uh, and electricity is a really awkward one. So electricity generation is mostly here in most states, um, but electricity transmission and distribution, so that's the poles and wires, generally uh, here or here, depending on which state you're in. Uh, so in New South Wales, you'd have to call them here. Uh, in Victoria, they're totally here. Uh, in Queensland, they're so it depends on which state you're in. So those are the basic ownership models. Now for the basic arguments for why you should pick one or other. Let's start with the basic argument against uh, the role of government. Uh, take that out of the space. <coughs> that sounds weird to start against, but uh, it makes more sense later when you see the argument. So, uh, in simple terms, and I am oversimplifying this, is only supposed to be sort of intermediate, it's about getting people all on the same page, making the right kinds of arguments. You can, of course, make them much better. Uh, the better you get at them. Uh, the first and obvious argument against public ownership is that it's unnecessary. That so long as the private sector is willing and able uh, to provide that service, so there are private companies that want to run the trains or provide toll roads or run hospitals or provide schooling or whatever it might be, then there is no literal need for the government to do it. So if the government doesn't need to do it, maybe it shouldn't do it. The second one is a, bit, is a stronger version of that argument, which is that it's inappropriate for government to run it. And the classic reasons here uh, usually are about two things. It's about a conflict of interest. Because the government uh, will always be the regulator, uh, or at least have some format regulation powers, even in markets that are highly self-regulated. So if the government's the umpire, it shouldn't be a player. Uh, this is really general principle. Uh, and the other one is that there can be unfair competition. And so this is in the sense of where you've got government involvement in an industry that also has private sector involvement in that industry. So one of the arguments that the private uh, media owners use against the ABC is to say, well, everything else we could say about the ABC aside, it's just really unfair because it's funded by the government and it doesn't have to operate on commercial principles. It doesn't have to worry about making a loss. It doesn't have to worry about uh, you know, making a big investment decision about moving into digital technology and finding out that doesn't work. Uh, they won't go bankrupt and disappear if they do that. So they operate in a totally different environment, but they operate as direct competitors to us. You know, they're running their television station right next to our television station. They're trying to poach our viewers. They're trying to poach our online traffic. So we have to compete against these people who don't operate on the same economic principles that we do, and that's unfair. 
Uh, and the third and final argument, and this is the one I want to spend the most amount of time talking about, uh, although still overall not much, is the very common term inefficient. Now, efficiency is a complicated one, and we could spend most of the day ranting about it, but the bottom line is economists uh, of the laissez-faire school have a particular view of what the word efficiency means, which they don't own that term, okay? They have a view about <laughs> what that word means, they're entitled to their view, you're entitled to make that argument in debates, but do not fall into the simple trap of thinking that if you're on the, on the uh, you know, free market side, you always get to win the efficiency argument, you get to win a certain kind of efficiency arguments, but not all kinds of efficiency arguments. Look, in, in economic theory terms, there are many different definitions uh, of, of efficiency. There's allocative efficiency, and productive efficiency, and all kinds of other sub-versions of what efficiency means. But in a debating kind of principle sense, uh, there are different definitions as well. But to put it in economic terms, the efficiency that, um, uh, that private sector operators bring is based on uh, the input-output model. And this is pretty simply the idea uh, that if you're lowering the costs in one sector as much as possible, then you're transferring benefits also to other sectors as well. But the entire economy is connected, uh, there's no industry that exists as an island, and so people are spending more money on buying bread and they've got less money to spend to buy milk. And so the inefficiency of the bread market has an impact on the efficiency of the milk market, even if you're not regulating the milk market in the way you would regulate the bread market. So seeing the economy as an interconnected whole and thinking about what the costs are to on, on the input side, what is the cost uh, in, in raw terms to produce the products, and then what are the output costs to consumers, and trying to get that ratio as tight as possible so that um, you're freeing up as much capital in the economy as possible. Now, that's a totally reasonable uh, definition, and it certainly has its values. And when you read in the paper uh, that you know such and such an organisation has done modelling to suggest that uh, you know policy X will lead to 300 jobs being created or four billion dollars being saved or whatever. Those models that are used by you know McKinsey and Ernst and Young and all those guys tend to be uh, more or less complicated versions of input output models, and they certainly have their value, and they're used quite extensively in public policy making. Uh, but as you'll see in a sec, they're not the only kind. But look, those are by and large the core arguments that you'll make in every debate that's about whether or not the government should be involved in. Uh, in industry X or Y in a microeconomic sense. And there are sophisticated, complicated versions of them, but I think that's the first principles uh, are those. And you'll see the contrast when we look at the role for government. Uh, and you can see how they directly relate to each other. So they kind of fall into two categories. Those that deal with market failure, and those that don't. So, the market value ones uh, are the obvious ones. And so, market value, again, is some more economic jargon. It simply just means that uh, the theoretical model of how the market should work and the theoretical model that the arguments for, for, for these things are predicated on, sometimes the assumptions that go into that model actually don't play out in practice. So, when people make the case, for, um, just generally, for free markets, they say, well, if you make a couple of basic assumptions, then it will always be the case that products will be lower priced uh, in a free market context than they would be in a government regulated context. But some of those assumptions are pretty important. One of those assumptions is um, perfect universal knowledge. So if every consumer in the market knew everything about the product and competing products and the prices and the cost and benefits of those products, and they always chose the one which was in their best interest and the most economically efficient to generate, then that would drive the market to greater and greater levels of efficiency because you couldn't get away with just gouging people on price. But of course we know that people don't operate in a perfect information market. Um, any of you that have ever made a major purchase of a computer or a phone or whatever knows you didn't know everything about every competing alternative. At some point you just kind of said, well, all my friends have an iPhone, so I'm going to get an iPhone. Or uh, Macs are cooler than PC, so I'm going to get a Mac. That's true. Uh, and that's totally how consumers make decisions um, all across the board, and it is a, a problem for that. Um, uh, yeah, the other one, of course, are things like if there were um, frictionless transfer of labour, so if companies could get access to workers without having to spend a whole lot of money going to find them or train them, then that has a big impact on the economics of the product. But of course we know we don't live in a frictionless labour market. Sometimes the people you need uh, in terms of skills or just general labour availability don't exist in the place where you want them to exist. Uh, and so that's a real problem for businesses who suffer labour shortages. But in input-output economic models, there are no labour shortages. The labour market is always wherever it needs to be, and it's always as well trained as it needs to be. Of course, in practice, I could go on and on and on, um, but 
what the market failure argument is, is that you have to understand that uh, not only is it possible for those theoretical assumptions to be missing in particular context, it's almost a given that there will be some of those missing in particular context. And the question is, how significant is the fact that those things are missing and does that justify a level of government involvement? So, to quickly break some of those uh, down, um, there's two ways to think about that. The first is what's called the theory of second best. So the theory of second best says if any of the assumptions that underpin the free market argument are missing in substantial terms, then it's actually better to have uh, to, to try to avoid removing all of the other distortions which might exist in the market because that remaining distortion or distortions will have a disproportionate effect not only on the industry that you're talking about but on other industries. So it's sort of counterintuitive, right? The idea is that if you can't get a perfect market then striving for the almost perfect market might actually be perverse in the outcome. And that what you want to think about is what's the actual effect going to be on the market as a whole, rather than saying, well, obviously the closer we can get to perfection is the best place to be. It's not always the case. Um, because what you might do is you might increase the problems that come from market failure, like a lack of competition. Um, but let's break down those market failure ones in a bit more detail. So uh, these are things like diversity, uh, uneconomic markets, uh, price inequality, so uh, I'll break that down, what I mean by diversity is I mean some, you can't have proper competition without a diversity of players in that market, so there may be a variety of reasons why for structural reasons or for other reasons, you're not going to get a diversity of players in that market. It might be because the barrier to entry is too high. So, for example, you've got Boeing and Airbus as the two major aeroplane makers around the world. There's no reason why the international airline market couldn't sustain a third player, except the cost of starting from scratch and building your own Airbus or Boeing is extraordinarily high. You'd have to spend a huge amount of money just to kind of develop your product and ideas and train your workforce and then try to kind of get a slice of the market. It's incredibly hard to do. No one's going to be likely to do that. And so Boeing and Airbus are going to continue to be the only two companies really that play in that space um, unless some major government intervention comes in to change that or one of them goes bankrupt. But that's not uh, a regulatory problem. There's no rule which says there can't be a third one. It's just the structure of the market has become so vertically integrated and so dominated that there's no reason why anybody else would ever take the risk of getting involved. Um, so. Uh, that's a market failure to an extent. You can't really have proper competition in the market with only two players because the opportunity for collusion or for avoiding competition is just too high. And so think about that in the, in the sense of airlines. Um, you know, we, we don't have a particularly competitive airline market in Australia compared to some other parts of the world because quite often Qantas doesn't have a real competitor uh, in, in the markets that, that it operates in. And sometimes its competitors are essentially itself. It's companies, other sub-companies that it owns. So yeah, it gets a little bit of competition from, from Virgin, but it's really competing against itself. Uh, the other one is uneconomic markets. It's a common market failure. And so that's where you might have great competition in the general market, but there'll be segments of the market where nobody wants to play because there's not enough money to be made out of it. And think about uh, city-country divides. So, you know, there might be... 50 different mobile phone companies willing to fight for your business if you live in Melbourne or the inner cities, but if you live in a you know, remote or regional place uh, where the cost of setting up the infrastructure is pretty high, the number of people there is pretty low, then you might think, I could probably make some money out of that, but I have to invest a lot of money and a lot of return. It's probably not worth it. I'll just concentrate on trying to dominate as much of the dense inner city markets as I can. Uh, and so that's a market failure because those people aren't getting uh, competitive supply of those services, and so it might be the case that the only way you can effectively provide services to those people is to control the whole product chain of the whole market. Uh, and you know, a nice example of that in the old days used to be about the postal service, that um, no one would operate a postal service uh, on a, on a for-profit basis uh, you know, in the age before the internet where you know, everyone was sending these people these little letters and envelopes that uh, you, know, you can't attach much cost to delivering. Because trying to get someone who's prepared to ride on their bicycle right out to the furthest away house in the smallest country town uh, is incredibly expensive for you know, the return of a 30 cent stamp. Uh, no one would do it. But if the government owns the whole postal network, it can take the profits it generates from the denser inner city areas and use them to provide a service. Country areas, but if you break it up, people want to dominate the inner cities in order. Country areas, 
Uh, and that's also a good example of the quality of price. So it might be that people will be prepared to provide services to those suboptimal markets, but they'll do so at a much higher price, and there might be public policy reasons why you don't want that to be the case. Uh, so you know, there was an interesting piece on uh, the current affair of today, tonight, earlier this week, looking at why um, the same service is provided at very different costs and at very different waiting lists for people uh, in hospitals in inner city areas versus hospitals in other areas. Uh, and um, that's fundamentally about, about market forces in a way, about the level of demand in those areas and how you can attract workers to work in those hospitals and what you have to pay them to work in those hospitals and so what that means um, for price. But of course, the tone of the story was, outrageous, you're being screwed. Um, but actually what's happening is, as the market becomes more privatised, you're getting more of those market forces coming in and people are making more kind of hard-nosed business decisions about how to price products rather than saying, well, why should someone who needs a hip replacement in country Victoria pay more than someone who needs a hip replacement in Northcote? Um, but if you're running a hospital on purely economic lines, you would have to charge different amounts. You'd have to pay fundamentally different rates for doctors and nurses and things to work in those hospitals. Um, so there are all those things that are really considered market failures and problems. Um, the other kinds of market failures that we should look at uh, are natural monopolies. Strategic industries. Uh, and essential services. So, natural monopolies can occur uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, some simple examples of natural monopolies are things like international airports. So, Melbourne has essentially one international airport. Uh, that's where, you know, 80% of all the flights come in and out of, and, you know, most destinations aren't served by uh, the second airport. So, essentially, Tullamarine Airport is Victoria's international airport. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why no one can set up another airport at the moment uh, at large scale to compete with that. So, it's a natural monopoly. Uh, our water services are a natural monopoly because while there's no reason why you couldn't have multiple companies offering you water in your house in the way that you have multiple companies offering you electricity in your house, the cost of building water pipelines and running them right next to the existing water pipelines is silly and no one would do it. So you can have what we have in Victoria, which is a kind of corporatized, uh, semi-corporatized structure for water where the water network is broken up into chunks. So there's an inner city water uh, area called Melbourne Water and then there are regional water areas like, you know, Golden um, Valley Water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of compete against each other, but they don't really compete against each other because if you live in the Melbourne water area and you're dissatisfied with Melbourne water service, there's nothing you can do about that if you'd like to continue to have a water service. You can't say, that's it, I'm done, you know, you're fired, I'm getting my water supply by Golden Valley Water. Um, that's not going to happen unless you're prepared to move into those areas. So the water network is essentially uh, a natural monopoly. So the question is, who is best to manage uh, and run natural monopolies? Now again, these guys would say, it's still inappropriate sometimes for governments to run natural monopolies. The natural monopoly argument is not as knock down Trump cards. It might be that, that simply because something's a natural monopoly is exactly the reason why it should be privately run, to avoid the maximum level of conflict of interest between government as the regulator uh, and government as the owner. But there are also good reasons why that's the case. Um, strategic industries. Now, we've had lots of debates in Australia recently about the car industry and whether or not it's deserving uh, of government support. Um, we can go into that in a lot more detail than we have time for today. But the argument in simple terms for why governments provide support for the automotive industry is that it has strategic economic value. Uh, there's a line of thought which says, I swear to God this is true, people make this claim, that no country has ever fully industrialised without having a car industry. None. No. And so if you want to look at the, the countries that have made the most rapid industrialization in recent times, the sort of so-called Asian tiger economies, countries like Korea and Malaysia and Thailand, they all invested very heavily through their governments in developing car industries. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have the capacity to build a car from you know, the tires right up to the finished product. There's only 13 countries in the world which have industries that can build a car entirely domestically from there to there. But there are lots and lots of countries that have chunks of automotive industry. And the argument's not that the automotive industry in and of itself is so big that it provides industrialization. But it's the kind of skills and training and ancillary industries that go around an automotive industry, which the existence of drives a whole lot of activity uh, and training and upskilling, which provides you with what you need to industrialize. Um, so there's a very good argument uh, out there, although it's not necessarily a knockdown, flawless argument, which says, uh, particularly for countries that are looking to industrialize, car industries are very important. But there's now also an argument which says, well, the problem is the question about government support for car industries has become a mixed one. We can't have this kind of pure debate about whether or not it's justified for the government to be involved or not, because all of those other 12 countries outside of Australia that have fully fledged car industries heavily support 
their car industry. In fact, Australia is one of the least supported of the supported car industries uh, around the world. Uh, and I think the, the figures are something like that, um, that in the US, uh, an individual car gets five times as much um, subsidy goes into building that than the automotive industry in Australia. So now there's a question about not just what is the pure role of government, but even if you thought there was an argument for supporting the Australian industry or for not, you're actually against uh, alternative uh, competitors that operate on the same principles. So have to decide if you want a car industry in Australia, it will not only have to be subsidised for the usual reasons, it will have to be subsidised because it's against competitors who are even more heavily subsidised. Uh, and that's pretty complicated stuff. So, look, I'm going to wrap up there very quickly because we have no time whatsoever. But just quickly, if anyone got questions about this? The reason why I do this is because I think if you can get your head around the privatisation debate and not only understand the models and what the pros and cons of those are in theoretical terms, but if you can get the language and the arguments right on these, uh, even in a fairly simplistic sense, then you're well set up for a whole lot of other arguments. And you'll see when we talk about stimulus versus austerity and all these things, the same kind of arguments repeat over and over, just at a much larger scale. So if you can get your head around individual industry X or Y, uh, you'll be well placed for uh, the broader debate. Question, questions? Can you give an example of like the theory of second best, where like a near perfect mm -hmm. market is worse than a regulated one? Yeah, well, arguably, and it's an awkward one for me to make standing in this building, but arguably the deregulation in the electricity sector, um, because of various market failures, arguably means uh, that there's, it's worse to have a badly privatised electricity sector than it is to have even a badly run public electricity sector. Uh, and so the reasons for that are, it's very easy to have a theoretical level of competition in electricity. So in Victoria in particular, uh, everybody likes to say, the previous state government, the current state government, all sides of politics like to say, Victoria proudly has the world's most competitive retail electricity market. Right? The world's most competitive. And what they mean by that is, uh, for per head of population, the number of different electricity retailers that you can choose from in Victoria is, inc is incredibly large. Right? Uh, there's something like... Uh, it changes all the time, but there's something like a dozen or so registered electricity retailers in the household retail market. There are others who only work in the private market um, for corporations. And that's a huge amount of diversity. And those are all genuinely differently owned groups. They're not kind of subsets of the same organisations or whatever. It's not bullshit. They're all really out there trying to gain market share. Um, but the way in which consumers go about making the choice about whether or not they'll switch from one retailer to another is a classic example of how the theories about how uh, efficient markets work just don't stack up in practice. Uh, and so even though you've got 12 different players or more in the Victorian market, the big three retailers dominate the market. About 80% of all households are connected to either Origin, AGL, or Energy Australia, it used to be called true. Now, why is that? Is it because their products are cheaper? Well, not necessarily, because there's so many different products in the marketplace that it's almost impossible to answer the question, who has the cheapest deal for you? Uh, which is why those comparison sites, in my view, are kind of ridiculous because they're, they're trying to crunch together so many different variables, not, not to mention they don't know how individual people use electricity at what times of day and, and to what volume. So they're up there giving you a very crude answer to a very complicated question and, and suggesting that that's you know, a decision you should make. But not, not only that problem, but we don't even know what effective competition looks like. So what we think it looks like is lots of people changing retailers from you know, one to another to get a better deal. And the way we measure that in electricity is what's called churn. So it's the volume of customers in a given year which change from one retailer to another. And the churn rate in Victoria is incredibly high, something like 25 or 30 percent of households switch providers in a given year. And that's part of this argument that Victoria has the most um, competitive market in the world because we have these incredibly high churn rates. But nobody actually knows whether the people who are churning are actually churning to a different uh, and better rate rather than just a different provider. And it might be, and we know this for a fact, that the number one way in which people make the decision to change from one retailer to another is because people knock on their door and offer them an alternative product. And that's a classic example of a lack of competition, right? Because what they're doing is, they're knocking on your door, they're saying, what are you paying right now for electricity? And I said, mm, I don't know. And they say, well, here's one product for you. Not here's a range of options for you and let's compare them and sit down with a calculator and none of that. Here's a product for you, and it's the cheapest product that retailer X has for you, uh, and on average, it would save you $400 a year. And if you sign up today, you get some steak knives. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding you, people offer signing bonuses all the time. They're not generally steak knives, but they, are, <laughs> they have various other things. And so people make these decisions, right? They say, well, if the average person could save $400, I'm an average person, <laughs> so I'll probably save $400. And, and I could do with some new steak knives because I like steak. So it all just seems like a winner. 
But it's actually little evidence and some compelling evidence against, but there's little um, proof that those customers are actually better off. In fact, they're probably um, you know, the least well off. But also, the flip side of that is that if you really want to get screwed in the electricity market, don't change retailers. Because the customers who are the most loyal are the most screwed. Because all the focus is on picking up those people who are moving. Right? That's how you gain market share, is to grab those people who are dissatisfied and to make them an offer, however you do it, through lower prices or free steak knives or flashy advertising, whatever it is, get those people in because they're how you change the market. And the way you offer those people discounts is you charge those people who aren't likely to leave your business. So you raise the prices on them a little bit and you take that bucket of money that you that you've gouged out of them and you use it to pay for short-term <laughs> discounts on people who get through the door. So, if you want to get screwed in the electricity market, change retailers. If you don't want to get screwed in the electricity market, <laughs> change retailers. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's because we don't actually really have an effective model of competition, and it's because the underlying assumptions that exist in the model of why retail electricity competition should be efficient is all wonderful in theory and works beautifully on paper. But there's a whole lot of behavioural economics which explain why it is that people just don't make rational decisions about why they should switch from one re retailer to another. The retailers know that and they do exactly what's in their interest, which is they exploit the way that people think and the way they make decisions. Uh, and a lot of people get screwed. Now, if you're a very, very savvy consumer and you do your homework and you understand the electricity market and you understand your own personal household usage, you can get a fantastic deal. Right? It's not that you can't win, it's that overwhelmingly people don't win. Right. And so it That's might be the case that if we just this, this hadn't privatised any of that and we still had a system like we had um, prior to the early 1990s where the government ran the entire electricity network, yeah, average prices might have been higher uh, than they are right now, but you wouldn't have a huge amount of resources getting wasted on people advertising and trying to promote churn. You wouldn't have a huge amount of confused consumers out there making silly decisions. And you'd be able to do other public good outcomes like use the revenue you gain from owning those businesses to do other good things. So the law of second best says, because there are some fundamental flaws in the model which underpin the argument, getting as close as we can to the perfect model doesn't actually get you closer to the best possible outcome. It might just get you in a perverse, highly suboptimal outcome. Does that make sense? So it's a long-winded explanation, but it's a really important concept that I understand it's tricky. Alright, any other questions? Um, okay. Sorry, there's one... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Couldn't see you. Yep, let's go, friend. Come on. Um, you said, like, we kind of all just, like, take the laissez-faire definition of efficiency for granted. What kind of other definitions of efficiency are there? Are there? Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, so, let's talk about hospitals. What, yeah. what, does it, what does it mean to have an efficient hospital? Uh, and, and what does it mean for a patient to be treated efficiently? Does it mean, for example, that they spend the least amount of time possible in the hospital? Because... Every hour they spend in a hospital bed. <laughs> Every hour they spend in a hospital bed is incredibly expensive, right? And they're taking up space that somebody else can't have. So ideally, in simplistic terms, you want people out the door as fast as possible. But does out the door as fast as possible also equal best possible treatment? And does best possible treatment mean overall lifetime lower health expenditure? Or does it just mean lower expenditure or higher expenditure in the short term? So, for example, if I rock up and I've hurt my knee, and I come in and I say, I've wrecked my knee, can you fix my knee? The doctor might just fix my knee. But while they're fixing my knee, they might think, well, while you're here, let's just run a blood test, and, you know, your eyes look a bit yellowy, let's just, like, you know, do some stuff. And let's check it out. What they might find is, I've got a whole lot of other stuff going on as well. And to, to identify at that stage that I haven't just wrecked my knee, but I also have the early stages of lymphatic cancer or whatever it might be, might be the best possible thing for me, and it might be the best possible thing overall, because catching that secondary problem at an early stage might make the treatment overall cheaper. But in that instance of me as an inpatient, having me stay there longer and do more tests and take up more time and more people's resources means the total cost of moving me through in that visit has been much higher and much more expensive. So which one has been the most efficient outcome? Well, I don't know, but if you have to report quarterly on things, on how much money you spent in that quarter, then moving people through the door is the most efficient way of getting your numbers down and, and, you know, and promoting shareholder value. But if you're the government and your view is, what's the lifetime cost of this system and what's the lifetime health benefits to, to voters, well then you might be less interested in how fast people get through the door and more interested in how comprehensive the service is. But they're totally competing models. Right? When you go to a private doctor, uh, who's got to see a line of patients, their incentive is to move you through as quickly as possible. But, you know, it flips around, right? There's also arguments that says getting people out of hospital beds is great because hospitals are just giant incubation, you know, places <laughs> for infections. 
So right. the longer that someone spends in the hospital, the more likely they are to contract a secondary infection and the more likely they are to be more expensive to you. So getting through the door might be better. Right? So on a pure input-output model basis, you would say, get them through the door, fast, fast, fast. The le least time they spend in the hospital, better. But on a holistic, um, you know, lifetime health, social, economic uh, impact for the community and the individual, you might say it's a totally different model that we don't have right now. So efficiency is complicated. It's only simple if you're making widgets, right? If your business is, I make nuts and bolts, the least amount of cost for the most amount of nuts and bolts is efficient. <laughs> so the, less, the, the minimum amount you can pay your workers without losing quality, the minimum amount you can spend on materials without compromising quality, and the maximum amount that you can churn out you know, without waste, that's efficient. And there's no argument about that, that's efficient. But once you get into other things like water, electricity, health, public transport, et cetera, et cetera, the definitions of these things become very important.